Welcome back 4060 Warners. This video will quickly overview the expectations for project two, which is comprised primarily of a chat server, both the server and the client portions of this. This kind of uh, technology should be reasonably familiar to you, having used it uh, throughout your daily dealings and in particular in our dealings together using the Zoom video conferencing software, which features, in addition to the video stream, a little chat box that allows everyone to communicate with one another. The basic premise, then, I can demonstrate over a screen to the side here. Uh, after you complete your code, more or less, you'll have two pieces. And as you punch in make, uh, the make file that you guys will write will build all these pieces together and importantly uh, give you a BL server and a BL client application. A few other things that are built here and you shouldn't concern yourself too greatly about those unless you're going to move on to do some of the advanced features of this for makeup credit. Starting up the server in one of the terminals that you see up here, uh, BL server, requires me to specify a server name, uh, call it server1, uh, and this is free to print whatever you find useful in terms of debugging messages. None of the output for the server itself is going to be checked to be any particular thing in particular. And I encourage you uh, to print out a lot of stuff here so that you can see feedback from the server as you're debugging. This will make it easier uh, to sort out difficulties that the server is having, for instance, getting stuck at times on code where you expect it to move forwards from that. The effect of starting this BL server should be to create in here uh, a little FIFO uh, called server1.fifo. I will refer to this generally as the join FIFO, as any client that wants to initiate contact with the server first put a re uh, puts a request into this FIFO. The server handles it, creates some data structures associated with that client, and then continues to correspond with the client. I'll do that now uh, by starting up in this upper right terminal, uh, BL client. Uh, I need to spec uh, specify the name, uh, in this case server1, of the join FIFO to use. Uh, notice the lack of the dot FIFO there, that should be appended by the client program itself. And then what my name is going to be on the server, I'll choose Chris because that's who I am. You'll notice over here then uh, that the server has acknowledged receipts of this in the debug messages that I'm printing. And one of the things that this client has done is to create a private communication FIFO uh, called uh, 289942 uh, client FIFO. I might have a misspelling there, but it doesn't matter too much. Uh, and a server FIFO. This generally is messages to the client then should be put into this FIFO and the client will be listening to that. And messages to the server are put by this client into to this FIFO, which are then read by the server. As uh, I would type things over here, hello world, uh, you can see responses to the server uh, by receiving this and then rebroadcasting it back to the client itself. You notice over here that we also got a sort of chat botch like performance where uh, the prompt I have down here uh, extends a little bit lower and the message uh, fills in up above. Uh, this will uh, work in some more detail or we'll deal with this in some more detail about how to go about that and look at some demo code that gives you a sense of how to set this up uh, without killing yourself. Uh, for the moment, let's start a few other clients though here. Uh, BL client. Uh, we'll call this uh, server1 also to be on the same server. Uh, and we'll call this uh, Ryan maybe. So here's Ryan. Uh, you'll notice here several changes. Uh, first, the server spitting out its uh, debug information has also sort of uh, acknowledged receipt that Ryan has joined. Uh, Ryan gets that broadcast himself. And the Chris individual in the upper right over here also gets notification uh, that Ryan has joined. At this point, if Ryan types anything, okay. Uh, then you'll see that transmitted up to Chris and vice versa if Chris types something uh, uh, from you. Uh, then Ryan gets that receipt. Anything that happened before this later client Ryan joined uh, is not something that they get privy to, at least not in the most basic version of the server. Up here in the upper right, uh, you can see though folks that join early get notification of those that are coming in late and see an entire transcription of uh, what's happened so far. Let's add a third client into the mix here, we'll BL client. 
Uh, we'll call this one server uh, and Sarah. Oops, sorry, missed the uh, server one part of that. So it's here. Uh, and so you can continue sort of playing around with this in several terminals if you like. Uh, you can see that uh, this gets a little bit tedious to test on your own, uh, but is invaluable to do with a few clients uh, at the start so that you can see what's happening in your server and how it may be misbehaving. Later on, we'll examine how to run the automated tests associated with this. Just a couple things to be aware of. Uh, if you type down here, for instance, hey, uh, and someone else preempts, uh, uh, nice to see you. And down here, so I'm going. Uh, and if I press enter in the upper right with stuff in the prompts down here, uh, you'll see that this nicely sort of extends downward. This is not going to be particularly difficult for you guys to implement because I've provided a built-in library, this simp IO library that provides this kind of functionality. Uh, the only thing that remains then is as uh, folks depart, gotta go. Uh, and you would, in a terminal like this, uh, indicate an end of input by using the control, the keystroke control D. Uh, that ends input here and notifies the server that this client has closed up their FIFO and will broadcast the server will uh, to other individuals that are there uh, to that this individual has departed. Uh, finally, then, in the upper right here, if you send a signal to the server uh, with a control C, for instance, an interrupt um, signal, uh, then down here, uh, the other clients will get notification that the server is shutting down and should also similarly shut down uh, somewhat gracefully on that, that front. So this is the premise of the chat server. We'll talk now for a couple minutes about internals, uh, about how this thing works. The easiest way to get a grip on this is to scroll down just a little ways and have a look at some of the pictures that represent internal data structures. The primary data structure that you'll concern yourself with uh, is within the server, uh, there is a big uh, array of client data and the type that's in there is this little client T type. Generally, each client has several things that you have to keep track of in the server. These include things like what their name is and what the file descriptors associated with the communication FIFOs are. In addition to that, the server has to maintain how many clients are presently on it, what its own server name is, and the file descriptor associated with this FIFO it opened using this server name uh, to accommodate any clients that are joining. Generally then, uh, the protocol for this is uh, the server will listen to each of the file descriptors associated with these folks, and that includes the file descriptor for joining. Uh, the protocol there is as a new client comes online through the starting of this BL client process, that client's responsibility is to set up the to and from FIFOs here, uh, the stuff that's going to the server and the stuff that the client will be reading uh, that is going to the client. So the names in here are indicative of who the destination for information is. All this gets set up uh, and then the client puts in a data structure uh, into the join FIFO. Uh, in this case, they have to include their name and the names of the two FIFOs that were set up. The numbers here, 864, 123, and what we saw over on the left-hand side, uh, are chosen based on the process ID associated with each of these clients. That isn't strictly necessary, but it's a very easy way uh, to get a unique identifier associated with files, is to make use of the process ID associated with whatever program is running. So on receiving uh, this indication, uh, the server should wake up and see there's someone trying to join. Uh, to that end, it will increment the number of clients so that are on here. And in this last open slot that's over here, uh, install information associated with the new client. All of this stuff is coming in from the client itself, so copying the name and the FIFOs here uh, into the client information, along with opening up uh, the file descriptors associated with those FIFOs for the server to be able to communicate. 
On joining, then, the server will broadcast out a message, and there is a data structure, a type, a struct in C that's defined in the blather headers uh, called a message T. This has a kind, which are just a bunch of constants, in this case indicating that someone has joined, and in that case, the body of this message doesn't make uh, much difference. Instead, it's only the name that is broadcast. This is how folks were able to see over here uh, this message about joining that was formatted somewhat differently. As uh, the server broadcasts to all the clients that a particular client has joined, uh, the client should respond by putting this on the screen for the folks uh, that are, uh, so other folks that are already on the chat service uh, are aware of it. This is one of the sort of primary protocols that you'll have to implement is uh, new client joining and notification to the remainder. And notice here the broadcast is just send an identical message that looks like this guy uh, that has a join and the name of the client that's joining to client one's FIFO, uh, to client two's FIFO, and to the client that was just joined their FIFO as well. As the uh, sort of progression of this message exchange business happens, the most common operation is going to be exchange of normal messages. And so with three clients online and sorted out in the server itself, as a client would want to send messages to everyone else in the service, it would do so by taking another one of these message T's, uh, plopping down the kind of message that's in here, uh, along with their name and the body of that message, and putting it on to this private FIFO uh, that is being uh, directed at the server. The server's job then is to wake up upon realizing, oh, there's something in one of these folks uh, that I should pick up and rebroadcast that out. Uh, then it will pick that message up, send it back, uh, not just to the client that sent it, but to all the other clients so that they are aware uh, that this message is coming from Clark. Uh, this is again just a matter of reading from a specific source and then iterating over all clients and copying that message into the FIFOs associated with them. Uh, finally then, as a client would want to depart, you would do so by signaling an end of input. The client process then should respond from this keyboard indication, I'm not going to type anymore, control D, uh, that it should close up uh, this server FIFO after sending a departure message. So this removes Bruce here, in this case, uh, from the server. And you can see all of the other clients get scooched down in the array uh, so that they are uh, more or less in order uh, as uh, they appeared earlier, uh, and gets then broadcast to them a message indicating the departure of the client that was leaving uh, Bruce in this case. Uh, there remain then only two, uh, and they are laid out sequentially in this array along with the number of clients here. So this will involve just a little a bit of array shifting. Whichever hole sort of opens up here, you shift things down into it. Server also will need to close up this uh, FIFO that's associated with that client uh, from its side as well, as it won't do uh, to uh, send anything else along those lines. So we'll want to acquaint yourself with some of the data structures that have been mentioned here. Uh, for instance, this message T, uh, which is used in order to convey information about a message coming from the server to the clients, and in some cases, uh, a client sending it to the server to indicate, in this case, they're departing. Uh, you also want to acquaint yourself with the kinds of messages in here, some of which we've discussed, and some of them actually have more to do with the uh, advanced features that you'll read about on your own. Uh, and finally, then there's a join struct, uh, which is used in that first step protocol, uh, which is what clients initially send to indicate they want to join a particular server. There are a couple of things uh, that are important to uh, sort of understand out of the gate about the server, and it's that it has several different file descriptors that it could potentially read from. There's a danger here uh, in that as Bruce would want to indicate he is departing, if all the server does is call a low-level read on these things in order, very likely it would read from this join FIFO first. And there being nothing in there, the server will block at that point. This is undesirable because until someone else comes and joins, uh, this message from Bruce is going to sit in here unattended to by the server. This is a case in which a multiplexed I.O. approach is very appropriate, where you ask the operating system out of this file descriptor, this file descriptor, this one, and this one, why don't you notify me, OS kernel, when one of those is ready? And tell me in some way which of those is ready. 
the poll system call is extremely useful for this and is going to be a central part of one of the routines that the server has to implement where it will assemble a small list of here are the sources I want to check call poll on them and which will cause the server to block as it was over here for long stretches uh, just waiting for someone to send something uh, and then eventually get woken up by the operating system when one or several of the clients here or someone joins in the joined FIFO when one of these FIFOs has data ready on it the OS will wake up the server and give it a chance to scan through to determine which of those sources uh, it wants to read from this poll system call then is demonstrated in a separate video and tutorial uh, so make sure to look at that uh, the other sorts of things that we should probably talk about quickly is the use in the clients of this uh, terminal IO stuff. If you look quickly uh, at the description of this, uh, there's a brief discussion of the simp IO library that's provided for you. If you're curious about the code in there, I encourage you to look at it. And included in it is a simp IO demo program uh, that is worth looking at. I'll jump over here quick uh, and open up uh, here this simpio demo uh, sorry run it rather um, this creates something that looks strikingly like the prompts and interface associated with clients and so it would be a good way to model your client program after the code that's in this simpio demo you can see that there are some uh, background sort of things happening here uh, and that this prompt that I have here continues to scooch down along these lines. Uh, if I type something like hello, uh, then you can see that message plopped up here uh, and then this sort of background process of some sort uh, continues to generate stuff. Uh, and this includes then if I type something like hey, uh, then the prompt scooches down on that front as well. Uh, if I finally press enter here, then we're good to go. Uh, if you analyze this code itself uh, by looking at the simp io demo.c program, uh, then you'll see that this background process and the process that is managing uh, the user keyboard aren't actually processes at all. Uh, these are pthreads. And the two threads, one to attend to some background entity and one to attend to the user typing, uh, this is very reflective of the structure that one would have uh, with the BL client, where you have to be minding what the server is sending and minding what the keyboard is uh, doing. So there's a wealth of information here that you can draw uh, from on how to set up your client using two threads to attend to those things. This is one of the instances in which threads are useful because we're not driving towards efficiency here to gang up with a couple threads on the same problem to cooperate and solve it, but we have two uh, entities running at potentially very different rates, and it becomes much easier to manage those uh, through the use of one thread to manage some background server stuff and one to manage the immediate user. Certainly those need to coordinate a little bit on some things, so but this file should give you some ideas about how to spin that stuff up uh, and use it effectively in your program. There's a wealth of other information uh, in here, including a discussion of some advanced features uh, down at the end. There are quite a few things that you could add to this uh, server, and we've used a number of system calls previously in the course. Now is a chance to put those to use. Uh, one of them is to uh, set things up so that you can detect automatically when the clients are disconnecting. Uh, one of the sort of things that I don't have built in this basic version right now, uh, or at least turned off on that front, uh, is that if I start up that server one more time, and start up here a client, the old client Chris, uh, and I'll have one on here, the old client Sarah again. Uh, if I say, hey, up here, uh, and then control C kill by uh, this thing, uh, you can see my server's freaking out just a little bit here. And Sarah didn't get any notification uh, that the client that she was communicating with is actually gone now. Are you there? Uh, so uh, to that end, uh, automatic detection by the server uh, that clients have departed is a good idea uh, to avoid hangups uh, about like this. An easy way to do that is to have the server occasionally ping clients. 
Good choice in this case would be maybe once per second. The server sends a little message that's not intended for the users to actually see, but it's just intended to make sure that clients are still alive. You'll need to make use of some system calls to get notification every second or so uh, that the server should send out to clients and then adapt your clients so that it responds to those uh, just to say, I'm still alive. Uh, it's useful to have logging features in a server to see what kinds of messages have transpired. And uh, to that end, if you establish a little binary file in certain formats, uh, then the server can create a log of everything that's gone on. Uh, that includes things like maintaining early on in the file uh, who is actually logged in. Uh, this sort of logging feature can allow a client to log in and potentially ask for what the last few messages are or to ask uh, who is actually on the server at a moment. Uh, and to that end, these are advanced features that are optional, but will earn some percentage of uh, makeup credits for those who would like to make up for lost credit on previous projects. The last thing that I want to mention uh, is that uh, there is an automated uh, testing framework for this. Uh, as you are downloading code, uh, you'll find that there is a uh, test uh, make file uh, that is provided. This is a set of targets that you should uh, include in your own make file by just saying include test underscore make file uh, in there, probably towards the bottom or top. This will add targets here uh, that will build based on uh, test based on the availability of your BL client and BL server here. Uh, and as I would just simply then do this make test, actually I'll clean first and make test. Um, this will compile everything uh, and first run the normal tests which have Valgrin disabled and we'll just check for correctness. Uh, this can take some time uh, because uh, coordinating several different processes uh, that involve the client and the server is somewhat tedious. And then we'll rerun all of those tests under Valgrin to ensure that it uh, has uh, um, there are no memory mistakes uh, in the code that you push out. Uh, finally, then, I'll mention, as usual, uh, there are some uh, tweaks that you can do. For instance, uh, using a test num equal to 2 will only run the second test, both the normal version and the Valgrind version. Uh, so this can be useful as you're trying to focus your attention on a single test uh, to make sure that it's working right. I think that's about it in terms of our introduction to the project. Certainly, uh, we'll have a chance to discuss this in more detail as you have questions come up. And uh, make sure to read through the specification, uh, start uh, looking at how you would orient your code, uh, and come to lecture next week uh, with any points that are yet unclear to you. As usual uh, with our projects, this is uh, allowable to do groups of up to two on this. Uh, and so as you would submit to Gravescope, make sure if you work in a partner group uh, that you have noted that in an appropriate file. Uh, there's a group members file, uh, so make sure both your names uh, appear in there. And also on Gradescope, uh, follow the instructions that are linked down here uh, from the first project to allow you to add your partner. One person sub should submit and then after for submission, add their partner uh, to get credit for that. I hope to see you all next week in lecture to discuss this and to round out our discussion of threading and other things. Hope everyone's happy and healthy and happy hacking till we cross paths again. <laughs>